Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, before we get started with the, the normal routine, uh, I'll need a motion to allow the board secretary to preside over the meeting temporarily. So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, Ms. Contenanza? Here. Mrs. Uh, yes. <laughs> we, we're going to do the roll call for here. Once we get all the new board members oh, sworn yes. in. Sorry. Yeah, so this yes. one's a, where's the yes or no to start this one off. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Uh, Mr. Fedorzik. Yes. Mr. O'Brien. Yes. Mr. Quelch. Yes. Mr. Zawicki. Yes. Mr. Sherman. Yes. And Mr. Hickey. Yes. All right. Thank you. Okay. Well, with that, uh, I'll read the Open Public Meetings Act. Notice of this meeting has been forwarded to the Asbury Park Press, the Beacon, tap into Barnegat, and placed in the foyer of the Barnegat Township, Barnegat Township Schools, uh, Barnegat Township Municipal Building has been on file with the Barnegat Township Municipal Clerk in conjunction with the Open Public Meetings Act. Uh, flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, uh, we have a report of the election, as you can see listed on our um, agenda there. Um, the results have been certified by our county office, and we'd like to welcome back Ms. Contenanza. Uh, and our new board members who will be swearing in in a, in a few seconds is uh, Alicia Bivens and Sandra Cherney. So. So, so with that, I'd like to invite uh, these three ladies up on the center stage here and um, our attorney Martin Buckley is going to administer the oath. Okay. With that, we'll do the roll call. Give you a couple seconds. Ready? All right, this one's here. <laughs> present or present, yeah. you obviously won't respond. Not present if you weren't here. So Miss Bivens? Here. Miss Cherney? Here. Miss Contenanza? Here. Mr. Fedorzik? Here. Mr. O'Brien? Here. Mr. Quelch? Here. Mr. Zawicki? Here. Mr. Sherman? Here. Mr. Hickey? Here. All right, we have a quorum. 
All right, next up is the election of the uh, president. Uh, right now, we will open the floor to nominations for uh, president of the Board of Education. And with that, we'll conduct a roll call vote once we have the nominations uh, set. So with that, do we have any nominations for president of the Board of Education? I'd like to nominate Sean O'Brien. Oh. Second. I'm sorry. Sean O'Brien. Okay. Second. All right. I'd like Motion. to nominate Michael Hickey. Okay. Are there any? Okay. We have any other nominations for president of the Board of Education? Okay, what we'll do is we'll make this a little bit simpler instead of a yes, no vote two times, we'll just, you just voice your, your vote for the person that you wish to be president. So in this case, it would be either Mr. Hickey or Mr. O'Brien. Okay. Um, Ms. Bivens. Mr. O'Brien. Ms. Cherney. Mr. O'Brien. Ms. Continanza. Mr. Hickey. Uh, Mr. Fedorzik. Can I make a statement for the record before I place my vote? Sure. Uh, I'm not one for writing stuff down and coming down with prepared speeches, but I've been mean, putting a lot of thought into this uh, uh, last two months, last year. Uh, we knew this was going to come up. I have to say that before I place my vote, you know, some concerning things that I, that I hear in the background regarding myself is that he's too friendly with this side or he's too friendly with that side. I'm up here for our students. Uh, you, know, you know, to address the public so you understand where I'm voting from, I maintain a relationship with pretty much everybody on the board. And I look forward to maintaining a relationship with the two new members. Um, with that being said, we need to come together. Um, what I'm gonna say is, you know, Mr. Bryan, I do not feel that you're ready for the position yet. However, I do understand that that's where the majority of the board's gonna go. And I do hear out in the community that they're looking for you. So with that, at this point, I'm gonna give you your opportunity and I will vote Mr. O'Brien. Okay. Mr. O'Brien? <laughs> Mr. Quelch? Uh, Mr. O'Brien. Mr. Zawicki? Mr. O'Brien. Mr. Sherman? Mr. O'Brien. And Mr. Hickey. I abstain. Okay. Uh, as the votes uh, demonstrated, uh, congratulations, Mr. O'Brien. You're now president of the Board of Education. So come on over whenever you're ready. He's over by you, right? This is vice president. Uh, yeah, this is vice president. Prove me wrong, please. Got it? Yeah, I Okay, uh, at this time, I'd like a motion to uh, turn the meeting over to the board president. So moved. Second. Second. Any a second for the second. motion? Second. Right. Mr. Bivens? Yes. Yes or no? Yeah. This, this yes one's a no. yes or no. We're, oh. we're turning the meeting over to the oh, president okay. so he can now take control yes. of the meeting like you'll be doing from now on. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I should have explained. I, I keep forgetting that you get into a routine. Um, so yeah, at this point, the board secretary during a reorg meeting usually runs it up until the board president. And once the board president is, is taking a seat, then he is actually in control of the meetings going forward. So at this point, I got to now formalize the process of giving it to Mr. O'Brien. So here it's a, a yes or no. Okay. 
Uh, so, Ms. Journey? Yes. Ms. Contenanza? Yes. Mr. Fedorzik? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Mr. Quelch? Yes. Mr. Zawicki? Yes. Mr. Sherman? Yes. And Mr. Hickey? Yes. All right. Meeting's all yours, Mr. O'Brien. Thank you. Um, right now, I'd like to have a motion for election of vice president. So moved. Second. Second. Um, the, the floor is open. Sorry, I it, don't mean to, to butt in. The floor is open. We need a, a person to run for, uh, I'm sorry, nominated for uh, office of the vice president. So we need a, a board member that you would like to nominate for vice president. I'd like to nominate Rick Quelch. I second. Okay. I nominate Doreen Contenanza. I'll second. If there's no other, uh, no other. If there are any other uh, nominations, we'll take a vote. You just say the name of the person you're voting for, please. All right. So, Ms. Bivens. Mr. Quelch. Ms. Cherney. Mr. Quelch. Ms. Contenanza. Myself. Mr. Fedorzik. Ms. Contenanza. Mr. O'Brien. Mr. Quelch. Mr. Quelch. Myself. Mr. Zawicki? Mr. Quelch. Mr. Sherman? Mr. Quelch. Mr. Hickey? Ms. Contenanza. Okay, with that, um, Mr. Quelch uh, has been awarded the Vice Presidency. to Dr. Lawis for the superintendent's information. Thank you very much. Um, first, I'd like to congratulate the new board members uh, and welcome to the board of ed. And I look forward to working with you guys going forward. And congratulations to uh, Rick and Sean on your uh, positions of vice president and president. Um, January is uh, uh, school board recognition month. So I'm gonna read a quick resolution um, and then I just wanna say a few words about it. So the resolution reads as, uh, whereas the New Jersey School Boards Association has declared January 2021 to be School Board Recognition Month, a time when all residents can acknowledge the contributions made by our local school board members. And whereas the Board of Education is one of 580 local school boards in New Jersey, which sets policies and oversees operations for the public school district. And whereas the Barn uh, Barnegat Board of Education embraces the goal of high quality education for all New Jersey public school students. And whereas the New Jersey's local school boards help determine the educational goals for approximately 1.4 million children in pre-K through 12th grade. And whereas New Jersey's 5,000 local school board members who receive no remuner remuneration for their services act as advocates for public school students as they work with administrators, teachers, parents for the betterment of public education. And whereas the school board strive to provide resources necessary to meet the needs of all students, including those with special needs. And whereas the Board of Education provide accountability to the public, they communicate the needs of the school district to the public, and they convey to the school administrators the public's ex expectations for the schools. And whereas New Jersey can take pride in its schools, which rank among the nation's best in key achievement indicators, such as the National Assessment of Educational Progress Scores and the preparation for college through advanced placement offerings and SAT assessments, now, therefore, be it resolved that the Barnegat Board of Education does hereby recognize the services of local school board members throughout New Jersey as we join communities statewide in observing January 2021 as School Board Recognition Month, and be it further resolved that the Barnegat Board of Education urges all New Jersey citizens to work with their local boards of education and public school staffs toward the advancement of our children's education. Um, just uh, saying a few words, now entering my third year as superintendent in the school district, um, I can say firsthand that the Board of Education members put in countless hours, um, week after week, month after month, uh, that are completely voluntary um, towards working with the administrative team uh, to see the school district uh, succeed and, and reach its fullest potential. And more often than not, I feel like the Board of Ed members are very similar to the administration where you're often put into a position where you're between a rock and a hard place and a lot of times have to make the unpopular, difficult decision. Um, 
And it's very rare that you guys get the recognition that you guys deserve for the amount of time that you guys put in uh, voluntarily into these positions. So I just want to say firsthand that I uh, really appreciate the support and the partnership that we've had in the past. And I look forward to having it again uh, going into this uh, next school year or going into the, for the rest of this school year. Um, and I really uh, just want to take a moment to recognize you guys for all the, the hard work that you guys put in. Um, and again, like I said, it's, a, it's generally a thankless position and it's a lot of hours. So um, really appreciate all your volunteer uh, service and, and work that you do with the district. So thank you. Uh, can, I know that that's a little bit out of the ordinary. Can, you, can we just do a quick uh, motion, a uh, second and a roll call for that? So moved, it, please. So get a, a motion to pass the school board's resolution month. School second. board's month resolution. So moved. Okay. Second. Cool. Uh, Ms. Bivens? We're on, yes. Yeah, yep. Move over to the next one, yes. Yep. <laughs> uh, Ms. Cherney? Yes. Ms. Contenanza? Yes. Mr. Fedorzik? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Mr. Quelch? Yes. Mr. Zawicki? Yes. Mr. Sherman? Yes. And Mr. Hickey? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, motion passes. I will turn it back to uh, President uh, O'Brien for President remarks and information. Sure. Um, I'd like to take a moment to say Happy New Year to my fellow board members, Dr. Latwis and the administrative team, our devoted teachers and staff, as well as the students, parents, and members of the community. As we turn the page into the 2021 school year, success for our children is of the utmost importance. While times are still challenging, we must remain focused and continue to work hard to keep the Barnegat School District safe. Our students' continuous growth and success must be achieved simultaneously. It takes a village to raise a child, and our village needs you. On behalf of the Board of Education, I ask that all of you be a more prominent part of this village. In 2021, let's set our sights high for district and community growth. Thank you, and I look forward to working with everybody up here and, and seeing you all at future meetings. I'd like to follow that up with making a motion to approve the Board of Education meeting dates for the 2021 calendar year. So moved. Second. <clears throat> Ms. Bivens? Yes. Ms. Cherney? Yes. Ms. Contenanza? Yes. Mr. Fedorzik? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Mr. Quelch? Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Zawicki? Yes. Mr. Sherman? Yes. And Mr. Hickey? Yes. All right. Motion carries. All right. I'd like to have a motion to appoint a delegate and an alternate delegate to serve as a legislative chairperson to the New Jersey School Boards Association for the 2021 calendar year. Who's it going to be? Uh, do we have any volunteers? I think you did last year. You were delegate. Yeah, they, those meetings kind of all got canceled last year, if I recall. And Doreen and, and were you the alternate last year? Do you want to switch or do you want to stay the same? Um, we could stay the same. Yeah, okay, so a uh, motion to approve Doreen as the uh, delegate and, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Contenanza as the delegate and Mr. Qualch as the alternate. So moved. Second. <laughs> All right, uh, Ms. Bivens. Yes. Ms. Cherney? Yes. Ms. Contenanza? Yes. Mr. Fedorzik? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. And Mr. Qualch? Yes. Mr. Zawicki? Yes. Mr. Sherman? Yes. And Mr. Hickey? Yes. Okay. Uh, motion carries. I'm sorry. Okay. And I'd like to have a motion to appoint myself as a delegate of the Ocean County School Boards Association for the 2021 calendar year. Can I join you on that one? So, so is the... Yes. Yep. I'll be the alternate. So yes, myself as the delegate and Mr. Hickey as the alternate. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Um, sorry. And Ms. Bivens? Yes. Ms. Journey? Yes. Ms. Contenanza? Yes. Mr. Fedorzik? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Mr. Quelch? Yes. Mr. Zawicki? Yes. Mr. Sherman? Yes. Mr. Hickey? Yes. All right. Motions carry. Okay. I'd like to turn the meeting over to Dr. Latwis for a Board of Education goals update. Thank you very much. Um, so at this time, I'll invite uh, Mr. Nickel, Mr. Barbieri, Mr. Gunderson, and Mr. Brennan uh, uh, to present on the goals, uh, Board of Education goals. So just to give a little bit of a background, um, 
at the beginning of the school year, or uh, I guess I say at the end of last school year, uh, the Board of Education works with myself to set goals for the upcoming uh, year. Uh, anybody that was at the, I believe it was the June meeting, we had a training on this um, where school boards came and then talked a little bit about the process, and then uh, we proceeded to set goals for this upcoming school year. Uh, so something that I thought would be uh, a nice way to kind of uh, bring the new board members up to speed on what those goals were and kind of uh, also take an opportunity to update the full board on progress made towards those goals. Um, we're going to be doing uh, these presentations going forward uh, during the reorg meeting. We'll do, it won't be a lengthy presentation, you know, maybe about 20 minutes or so, um, but it'll give an opportunity to kind of update where we are on the four goals uh, to this year. So actions that were taken and then kind of some next steps that are planned out. And then that'll also open the floor for any feedback or anything um, as far as uh, questions or, or feedback. So uh, without further ado, I think uh, Mr. Barbieri has the first goal. Um, so I will uh, turn over the mic to you, Mr. Barbieri. Thank you, Dr. Lattos. 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 Thank you, Dr.
so they're very close to being, um, you know, on grid level, but the, the, the broker says, you know what, we're just not 100% certain they're the right on level, um, and then uh, approaching expectations, partially meeting expectations, and not meeting expectations. So those are the percentages. Obviously, that baseline, we anticipate tremendous growth from there. Um, personally, I'm not going to you know, feeling very strong confidence that we will uh, exceed the goals that we established for ourselves to extend the jersey to ESSA. Um, and, and, and here's why, let's keep down the curve. Um, so we've done quite a lot of work in helping the kids uh, to be successful in this year. So it starts with our remote learning plan. Um, Mr. Jones will speak to be speaking a lot more about that later, so I'll kind of refer to that. But basically, uh, you know, we had to figure out a way for learning to continue whether hybrid, virtual, in person, so on and so forth, and take a look at what that was going to look like, and getting the teachers ready to be successful in that type of, you know, uh, multi-environment. I'd like to focus a little more on this. This is the data harvest. This is something that we started in uh, a very unified way last year, and then this year we really ramped up. And that is helping us as a learning community become much more adept and adroit at using student teaching data to identify specific uh, strengths and weaknesses for individual children at the standard level. So for too long, we painted with a very broad brush in the district, so this, this child would say, hi, medium, low, or whatever. And that's not really very helpful for a teacher. Yeah, I know this kid's struggling to read, but like, tell me where specifically. So we were able to get the, the software to our benchmarking system, um, the ESGI, Star Reading, and even all of these uh, online learning platforms that we utilize. They give tremendously detailed and specific information student by student that allows us to identify, again, individual strengths and weaknesses, cohorts of strengths and weaknesses. A particular teacher might be, you know, hey, we might be able to work with this is so and so in fifth grade, say, hey, your, your kids are crushing it on these five standards, but these one or two over here that I'm struggling with. Maybe the best teacher of the data coach to find a new way to present that material. Um, we've done a lot of that. And then the data harvests are where we come together, uh, they're, they're building based. So, led by the principal with his or her team, uh, so your guidance counselor, your, your, excuse me, your school counselor, your data coach, your uh, vice principal, supervisors, anybody, anybody at the table, development to figuring out all of the different data points, not just the attested data, uh, attendance, hit. Uh, so, harassment, intimidation, bullying, discipline, all of the different factors that go into making a student's uh, you know, experience positive and successful. And we take a look at tracking all those indicators and how they're going up and down, you know, or whatever the case may be. And, and that is a real time source of information for us, you know, every six to eight weeks cycle for us to figure out, hey, what's going well and what we need to work on. So, these are these found that we can get a chance to take a look at all the different things that we look at. So we look at the RTI process, response to intervention. Um, very lengthy, I've talked about it before, I'm moving the boss over tonight because it is something we are extremely proud of. And if you do get a chance, please follow that sample RTI plan link. That shows uh, one um, student's plan, obviously, the name has been redacted, um, but it shows you the enormous amount of time, effort, and energy that's put into one individual student in terms of finding out where he or she has deficits and the amount of, as we said, time and effort and energy to go into through these different tiers to help that child overcome uh, those gaps. And then lastly, PLCs, and we'll talk more about this on the next slide. Uh, PLCs are not for professional learning communities. And thank you for the board uh, and to the board for supporting our current schedule, which does have PLCs built in uh, for teachers to have time to collaborate and work together and look at this data. Um, it is an enormous challenge. Shout out to the teachers listening, uh, you know, either here tonight or, or um, remotely, uh, because it's, it's a tough job. It's a very good job to be a teacher. Um, and so thank you to the board for providing that you know, time and resources to, uh, to support that. Mr. Barbieri, can you go back for one minute and just click open the RTI tier plan and just go through that for a minute? I just, I think it's important for people to see kind of how all that stuff comes together. Sure thing. So can I ask uh, one of our friends in the booth, please click on that sample, I should have to make that note when I think there's that uh, capacity. <laughs> no? No? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
How do you stop the person from charging? Say, you want to yeah, there we go. Um, that's the idea. Uh, yeah. So, for those people who are nervous, I find the experience of technical difficulties sometimes more bad jokes at this time. Yeah, we'll see. That would build the place. Can you bring it up? I can't remember. Yeah, So this just shows the monumental amount of time and energy that goes into helping one student. Uh, so we track all of those data, and we, we just scroll down here to the third So this is just to help one student accomplish one standard. So this is where an area where even if the kid has, has you know, uh, good or bad marking period grades, these are areas of concern that we've identified through our measurement that we have to do. So there are some of the benchmarks for them, scroll down, we can multiple measures, multiple data points, start reading for the warrior, there might be math scores or maybe tests and stuff, populated from the teacher itself, and scroll down. So this shows one day. Okay, so there's three tiers. Tier one are things that are happening in the classroom. So this is an ELA standard. Uh, the reading of uh, informational text for grade five and standard four, which is going to be getting way more than grade five. And that's the target of the child. And then these are resources that get populated by our data coaches because the teachers are so busy these days. They need help finding the resources because all the kids need different, you know, differentiation. They need, they need different things, right? So the data coaches are like, hey, you might, you might have tried this one with the toolkit. Okay, well, here's some other things you may not have thought of. Well, here's some other resources that we have. Uh, that are all trying, that are aligned to that thing that's loading the nothing to go to that. So tier one is, is, is our interventions that happen in the classroom. It's a way of helping teachers differentiate. And if you scroll down, please, so we'll do tier one for 60 AVs if the child is still not progressing, you get a low point tension, and we'll move to tier two. And that's also just so you can see what the screen is tier one. These are uh, the tips by the teacher, the plan, these are the teacher in the classroom, like what's happening, what's going on, if the child is responding, if the child is not responding. Almost all of them, not at the bottom. And that we're going on. So we're trying to first promote you know, intervention, monitor for sustained use, and scroll down, please. And if that doesn't work, we try to move to tier two. A little more inter uh, intensive, if that uh, continues. It's a little bit hard to see the graphic there, but uh, the tier two programs are online programs. So this is um, a chance for the child to uh, use more of the AI uh, or adaptive learning. So they'll, they'll take a diagnostic, um, start practicing problems. They get the pop right, they get a little bit harder, they get a little bit harder, they get it wrong, it's a little bit easier so they find that they trust right level. And again, just a chance for them to continue practicing these skills. Um, and that's how it works. So we have the teacher working in the classroom, we have the kid on an online program. If that doesn't, it's still not producing the results for you, then they go to tier three. Um, we call it our AIR program, Advanced uh, Interventions for Remediation, uh, formerly known as uh, Basic Skills or BSI. We have. And uh, this shows uh, specifically what the child uh, is working on with a BSI teacher, uh, you know, the frequency, the duration, the types of activities, things like that. So this is an enormous amount of uh, time and energy still and should travel. Um, and this is to help one child in one area. One child in one skill. So you know, when I said that and you're confident that we're going to see uh, you know, help the ability to remediate the loss of skills from last year and you know, still help the kids move forward. It's because, you know, a huge shout out to uh, the teachers, the data coaches, the counselors, everyone who's good at all hands on that approach because honestly our kids need that level of support. Okay, yeah, and then there's some other things on the side. So thank you very much. I think Dr. Miles would to uh, highlight that kind of see those there. Okay, and we turn to the presentation. Um, so, uh, Professor Tom Academy, okay, we can talk a little bit about that figure. And something else we're really, really proud of, uh, Professional Development Academy is, is, as the name implies, uh, you know, a way to help teachers continue to learn and grow and facilitate them 
uh, we're doing it much more on our state. And what's special about our PE Academy is it's five teachers, four teachers. So uh, yes, the admin helps to set the topics, uh, but we also do feedback on staff on what they feel good. Um, and does that mean yes, we provide, you know, whether it's um, the trainings, special training resources, uh, book studies, all those things. But at the end of the day, it's teachers teaching their peers. And we feel that that's going to be a lot more responsive environment. We have about 25 so, yeah. freshmen. It's also much more you know, efficient uh, from a like, monetary perspective as well. The way to do it. So rather than sending 50 teachers out to the workshop at two hundred dollars each, you know, we're able to keep a lot of those costs in house. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, PD Academy is in the morning, and that's what we're doing. We're doing the part of three year plan. This is kind of lengthy. Uh, we're doing the part of three year plan, but I do strongly recommend it uh, for the board members, for the new board members. Um, when you get a chance to take a look, it has an executive summary of the things we've accomplished in curriculum um, last year, as well as where we are in that uh, you know, three year plan going you know, forward. And then every year, the uh, PD sort of rolls off. And so, right now, all the other training, you know, uh, 2019 to 2022. Now we're at 2020, and then you see the class before the last year. I've already spoken to you on the front. I have really good things. GT program is all my phenomenal. Sign up training, we have an increasing population of English language learners, or ELLs, in the district. Sign up is a way to support infrastructure. Um, uh, you know, matter for providing instruction uh, for students who are native language, not English. Uh, Ryan Magic. Ryan Magic is a, is a program that's the name, yes, it's not a title that's actually that it's called their, their program, but it's a, uh, a phonics based approach um, that you know, we found was lacking in our primary base for a long time, unfortunately, it led to some of the reading deficits um, that we see today uh, in, you know, in the kids that are older. So we talked a little bit more robust box program in the primary grade, and that's been fantastic for that. We have all scheduled for grad to graduate school and uh, revised curriculum. So a lot of stuff going on. So we're very excited about it. Um, thank you for indulging me, and I'll pass the mic to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Brother. Thank you. And again, I want to congratulate the new board members and the new uh, president and vice president. Congratulations, and uh, we look forward to working uh, closely with you. So one of the things is uh, our goal too is technology. We have a little snap here before that, but uh, te technology is to use our formal suggestions from our technology and security about the vulnerabilities uh, testing that we've done with an outside source, along with our technology three-year plan to improve both areas and districts. And our objective is to work with an outside consultant, uh, to improve District cyber and security, along with streamlined technology department, to be more efficient as well as reduce costs, improve upon our policies, procedures, along with constant ongoing evaluations and systems. So, through our evaluations, we found out that there were many issues with our firewall, uh, anti fire systems, our camera systems in all the buildings, um, and a disaster plan, which we found out we did not have a disaster plan. So, we've gone over and done many different things. To accomplish that, one of the things we had to do was transform our network. We went from, we had multiple networks in six different buildings that we had. So if a student logged on at Collins School and wanted to log on to so World War II or Hornet history, it might be routed from Collins School to the Corbell School, back to the Bradman School, high school, before it came back to the Collins School. And that would take many, many, many seconds, if not sometimes even longer for that student. Now we were switched over this past November to a one wide area network, okay? And this actually was cut down to one firewall. Previously, that we had four firewalls. Again, cut down to one firewall. It seems to go on the Three different firewalls. Now there's one firewall that is delivered to our hacker. It's a lot more accurate. We went to a mesh network that provides one gigabyte to each building, which is six gigabytes in the district. We are one of the fastest for network in the Ocean County, the schools are size. So the kids can't see it right now. But when we do come back full time uh, with all our students, it's going to be remarkably different than it was right after. This is what we did this past November, and that was the ground. Uh, so uh, we have actually come up with a disaster plan that we're working on just in case, because you've heard many different stories where you get corrupted by different uh, outside organizations, demanding money, demanding 
had some of the back and Sherry told us last year they took over the students' grades and go over to different um, school districts. Now we have Sherry has a job that to mitigate that. And now we have to like she had the cameras in her mouth for the strings. There are many different things. We've had three different time systems in the gym. We actually now have a system where we've evaluated all our cameras and now we've mesh them all together to one system. One system that has worked with the police department, the county, and also all our buildings. <coughs> We've also, sorry, we've also gone over different district policies. We found out we didn't have district policies for board members to sign up. You know, about uh, Chromebooks. Uh, there are different things. Students weren't signing up stuff. We have those policies now for everybody to sign up. We have to come code. We didn't have any idea how many different objects we have, whether it be iPads, Chromebooks, all these different things. So now we can actually have a direct fund. We ordered 900 new Chromebooks this year. Unfortunately, the whole world ordered Chromebooks, so we've gotten 450, and then we're promised another 450, but they keep pushing off from September, October, November, December, until the end of this month. We completed a one to one initiative with our seventh and twelfth grade. We have a one to one initiative with our certified staff members. We continue to create standard operation procedures. Our PD continues, not only with our certificate staff, but our non certificate staff, as well as cross training them with our technology department. And we're continuing to evaluate the equipment we have, software upgrades to continue to make us quicker, faster, and better, and more safe. And we're recycling all our old equipment that had just been, you know, collecting dust and sitting around, which we get you know, paid back for that as well. And now I'd like to turn it over to the facilities. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm here to demonstrate uh, some of the things that we've accomplished and are pretty proud of. Uh, the good things and unfortunate about is the pretty clear path. Uh, pretty much we know how to get there. We just fill out potholes along the way. My colleagues are, are running up and down streets based on that. So you're going to see some um, pretty large things that happen, and you may have to follow along in our agendas over the past uh, couple months and over the past year since I've been here. In large dollars, but uh, they translate into large, uh, large projects. Uh, one of the problems that was presented to us late last year is that our underground storage tanks that fueled our, uh, our vehicles uh, was reaching and in some cases exceeded the uh, expected life. Therefore, we wouldn't have insurance coverage to help us if there was ever a disaster environmentally and things like that. So we had to make an adjustment. We installed above ground storage tanks and we below ground storage tanks, and now we have a new. Um, standard facility that we can use that have the protections and the insurance in place where we will have to be. Uh, <coughs> sure enough, this fall we can receive notice because the insurance company wasn't aware of the tanks for now that we would not have insurance for that. So we are uh, we're, we're totally up to uh, standard on that, on that facility. Uh, replacement of the, the Bracken Middle School geothermal. Uh, about a year ago, a little less than a year ago, our Geothermal system failed where the pipes have run underground and warm the water and, and cool and heat the, the district, rotted out and caused failures in, internally. So we had to hurry up, design, bid, and uh, contract out how to get that completed. We should be finishing that up in uh, January, the next couple of weeks. I have a meeting tomorrow, status update, and a little bit of a delay there. That uh, had some contractor challenges um, and some COVID challenges that came along with that. So we'll, we'll be completing that in parallel. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I'm charged with is to find ways to finance these large projects. And one of the avenues that, that allows school districts is to lease equipment upgrades under an energy savings lease, but provided that the energy savings in aggregate for the funds the uh, payments for the lease. So in this case, we have a $5.8 million construction project currently going on that includes solar and LED lighting, but it also includes a control system. Because even if we have brand new equipment, if we're not controlling it properly, it's almost worse to not even have it at all because you're running it outside of the capacity of what it should be and not providing the comfort and the learning environment that we need. So we completed that uh, funding of that lease in October, uh, completing the LED lighting. But in, you might have noticed as you walked in here today, uh, in uh, January, we're expecting to be done with that. And we're waiting to 
kind of finalize the paperwork to start. You'll see carports with solar panels on them, and of course, solar panels on the roof. Uh, the energy savings and a little more green environment. You can start to start quickly. Um, we needed to, with the great game that came about towards the spring of last year, we needed to rework our infrastructure and our transportation. We were able to do that despite the COVID challenges that came about. Uh, we're still seeing some challenges that are attributed to COVID. But we, we did need to find our inconveniences, and it's something that we set out to achieve it, and we did. Fully automated work order system, it kind of, it's, one of the justified criticisms that we received when we're making these upgrades was, where's the maintenance record? How come this is occurring? How come there are all emergencies? And I had the same questions myself. We're instituting a program called School Do Better, a complete work order, preventative maintenance uh, district system um, schedule. And this is going to help us. Not, we want to predict the failures. We don't want to react to them. And this is the system that we're going to need. And it's going to come at the cost of free training. Uh, some of the staff and just don't know how to use the automation. So this is going to be a big thing that we should be accomplishing. Really, you should be seeing that towards the beginning of next year. But it is in place, and now it's just kind of the training and setting the expectations. And as with uh, Mr. Gunderson is going to go into in a second, we had to implement the necessary COVID response. And I think this is one of the things that I'm most proud of because of the plans that Mr. Nickel talked about the technology, some of the plans that we started to set up facility wise. When the government started funding us to do distance learning and react to the facility constraints, we already had the plan in place that made it much easier for us to just institute the plan a little bit quicker. So we're able to take advantage of some, some, some significant funding from our government, but use it to something that's been bad for us for years to come. So I'll let uh, Mr. Gunnarsson explain on how we uh, responded in a little bit more detail with the COVID, but uh, that's that sets up my goals <laughs> and my personal goals. So. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Brennan. Uh, welcome to the new board members. Congratulations, everyone. Look forward to working all together. Uh, so, last year when uh, COVID hit back in March, uh, we shut down, everyone shut down in New Jersey, and that was, um, you know, really, really difficult to deal with, obviously, at the time. So, in the summer, when uh, the 300 some uh, page document came out from the governor's office, uh, letting us know that we would be able to open for in person instruction, and there was 300 pages worth of things that you had to make sure were included in that plan. And, you know, um, we're going to go through some of those things, but you know, what we knew was that there would be some things that we would have to make sure that we accomplished. Goals that we knew that were within this goal, some objectives that were going to be important, the things that we wanted to be able to do. Um, obviously, the first bullet up there is talking about the health and safety of students. Obviously, everybody's well being is very important to us, but in addition to that, in order to maintain any kind of in person instruction, we have to keep everybody healthy and safe. Um, the second goal there, as far as we always knew that we wanted to have a copy back of full in person instruction. We didn't want to set up some sort of plan to bring students back that didn't allow us to get to the end goal of going back to full person instruction. Um, for it to be a blended model, it was also important to us because we understood that there would be um, times where maybe a student um, had to quarantine and we wanted them to be able to have a seamless transition to go into quarantine, participate virtually, and come back and be able to do that uh, in an effective manner. And then uh, the last goal there is to be able to transition, uh, well, that's part of what I was talking about, transition from the for full virtual learning from pro, uh, program back into uh, a hybrid model where we have some in person. So we did all these goals. Um, big thanks to a lot of the community. We had probably about 50 people over the summer that came together in a cafeteria, social distance, of course, and worked on first look at what things were going to be important to the community, which is kind of where we came up with these things that we wanted to make sure we accomplished within the plan. Um, and just seeing everybody come together, there were some board members that were there, uh, lots of community members, administration, teachers, nurses from the school district, and so on. All right, so the numbers. 
When I say that, I think that what we did was really successful. These are the kind of things that it speaks to. So up here you see the number of student positives from September till now, four full months, uh, there were 25. Now, in-person student population, not the total district population, but actually students coming to the school in person um, was over 2,300. That comes out to a 0.0104% positivity rate. And of those thousands of students, you're also talking that they're here every day. So in reality, it's even that number of times, the number of days you've been in that students came here, went home, and 25 that actually were positive. For the staff positive, it was 39. Um, obviously, there are a lot less staff, 630, but even that positivity rate comes down under, um, you know, 0.1%, it's 0.06, and change right there. So, um, that, that, was, that was something that encouraged us that what we had to together was a plan that worked. So, I want to uh, define for you something that's called the close contact exposure. So, when we find out that someone, uh, whether in the district or at home, was possibly exposed to somebody who was positive for COVID, at the beginning of the year, we start out with this first definition. And basically, that was that for 10 minutes straight, if you were within the six foot bubble of a person that was positive for COVID. If that happened, you would have to quarantine. They updated that definition so that rather than being, you know, I'll text you up, Mr. Brennan, for nine minutes and then we separate and I speed up for two hours later uh, and, and stay on the 10 minutes that we're good. We get a little bit more time here in the way that they define this 15 minutes, but that's cumulative for 24 hours. So if I have a few meetings with Mr. Brennan, at the end of the day, we just try to stay outside the six foot radius so we don't have to keep a stopwatch around her. But those are the way those definitions work, and that tells us. When somebody has had something that's considered an exposure, and that's when they would have to quarantine. Now, why is that important? As, um, take a look here. So, for the folks that were exposed, based on those definitions I gave you there, for those folks that were exposed in school and went on quarantine, none of them ended up coming back tested positive. So what does that mean? Why is that? So there are several things that we have in place as far as safety protocols. And these didn't impact how that definition works and who was considered a close contact. But what we do believe very strongly based on the slide with the numbers um, is that the things you see listed here contributed to the fact that even though by the definition of close contact, we had plenty of individuals have that scenario here in school, none of them actually came out with COVID. So here's some of the protocols that were set up in place. Obviously the basic ones are the masks. Um, within being within six feet of someone, uh, that definition, it didn't matter if you had a mask on or not, but we have people wearing masks, we're asking them to stay six feet apart. But in addition to that, we put together uh, SOP standard operating procedures for sanitization. So we have our custodians that do cleaning, their procedures are uh, upgraded and they have upgraded equipment in order to do that. But our teachers and other certified and non-certified staff members also participate in these uh, sanitization procedures, which we believe contributes to how well we are dealing with our numbers. Um, we purchase barriers for students. Again, that didn't prevent them from having to quarantine. But uh, when they were considered a close exposure, but we do believe that was another contributing factor to why none of those students that were a close contact actually tested positive. And then uh, protocols for common areas. So if you think of like the offices, uh, the main office of the school. So when you walk into an office, you might see something different than what you would have seen in the past. There's uh, Plus the last hanging, maybe there's areas roped off, or maybe there's a limited number of people that come into that area. And so well, why? Why that looks different from the class? Those areas have all different people from all around the school that under the normal operating of the school would be in, out, passing. And so if somebody were to test positive and be in there, you really would have a very difficult time tracking who they were around, they were in those areas, and it would become like a hot spot, a hot spot. Or let's spread it. So things like that we put in place. Um, we we, we re 
Ranch has to uh, teachers get their mail, so they're not all you know coming to the same place. Things of this nature, we're able to um, collectively take what we're considered close exposures and prevent those people from actually contracting COVID within the school. Another thing that we kind of anticipated when um, we realized our students were at home, and if you're a lot about it, you just, the news was reading, is that the students' well-being, mental health, not just the risk of COVID, but being home, that time, not socializing, not having those experiences that we you know are so important in school. What would the students be like when they came back? What kind of supports were they going to need from us? So our approach was all hands on that approach. Um, we had our counselors, CST members, and there's a list of them up there, social workers, school psychologists, even our nurses. Everyone in that group there worked to be prepared in order to support our students' social and emotional needs when they return. Um, the good thing is, I really, it was a lot less than anticipated. It seemed like the students who came back and we got to see them in person, um, we, we thought it was going to be managing you know, a, a disaster that happened, and that there was going to be a lot of you know, just students breaking down in the office, talking about like what their experience was um, when they were home. And fortunately, it, it really didn't look like that. Um, but in the meantime, it was good that we were prepared, and for those students who needed those supports, they were in place. Uh, we have some really unique online resources that were created. There's a link there at the bottom um, that our uh, student assistance counselor here at high school put together. It's a fantastic resource to build in. It looks really nice. Uh, and my understanding is getting a good amount of student traffic, and they're actually enjoying um, some of the things that are on there for them. So we started this talking about always wanting to have a transition to get back to full in person. So you had to have a plan in place that allowed for that transition. So what we started with in September, we called phase one. In September, we had two in-person days that were six hours each, two of what we called week days, where there was remote extension activities, and one virtual for everyone that which was on Fridays. So for those folks that were able to come and be uh, in person during um, a particular uh, week, they would have 12 hours of that in-person instruction. Now, the little ads up there next to lunch was because at that time we were sending some radio students in for six hours, but sometimes there wasn't actually instruction going on because they actually had to stop lunch. In phase two, after we started to look at that data, and we were able to see that students and the teachers weren't contracting COVID in schools, we were able to move to the next phase of the plan. And the second phase of the plan here, that's the wrong button. I still thank you, but we gotta go back for close. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Looking for the laser. Where are we got? I still want it. Oh, watch this. There it is. All right, so um, phase two, um, five in-person days. They were four and a half hours each, which was a shorter day. But when you do the math on that, uh, that meant for a week of a student that was doing in person, they're in school for 22.5 hours, which is a 10 and a half hour game. Plus, don't forget about the little lunches that were being taken by the instructional time in phase one. So we got a considerable amount of increased in person instruction uh, with the phase two plan. The idea that there's a blended model is in both phase one and phase two, there was always the option for this hybrid, um, as described in the previous two slides, but also for the um, families that wanted to elect the option for full virtual, and because of the, the formatting of how we utilize our teachers, there was flexibility and uh, a way to kind of move between the two plans. Um, and, and that's outlined here with the benefits of those models. And ultimately, with the idea that we went phase one, we went phase two, and the ultimate goal is getting back to that full in-person instruction. Okay, so this here outlines, um, there were only three instances uh, over the course of the four months that we've been open to in-person instruction where we had to 
um, closed down the school for a period of time. So in the first instance, um, Cornell High School, uh, based on the number of quarantines, uh, based on exposures that were reported, um, didn't have a staff room and they closed for two weeks, although the staff room was quarantined, and then we were able to reopen. Um, at Collins, there was one day that was similar in that there was uh, not the staff that opened for that one day, uh, and that it was closely followed by um, two untraced cases. So typically, every time we find out somebody had COVID, they knew that they were with um, their dad, they live at home, dad got at work, they lived with dad, they were quarantining, they were positive. Is somehow, some way, when we start to do the interviews with these folks, um, county uh, department health works with us, you get, they get to the bottom of it. Everybody kind of figures out who, who they know that they know they were around at it. So what ends up happening is, if, if they just don't know, I'm not sure, I could have gotten it at Walmart, could have been at the food store, uh, maybe, you know, their, their spouse had it, and they didn't even know, but, Two, two cases happened like that within a, a short period of time at Collins. And so the Department of Health says in, in that step, in that case, if there's two, and those both people are in the same area, out of an abundance of caution, what they recommend is that you flew that place because maybe they can track it. But really, just they don't know where they can track it. So that's, that's the protocol they put in place. So um, on their advice, uh, we closed. Um, it was fortunate, it was fortunate timing because. It was two days before we went off on break, so we only lost two days to have a part in that building based on those on trades. Uh, but ultimately, we don't know where those came And just to wrap up, there was a big piece to this success that had to do with the planning, the community members that were there, the staff, board members who took part in the planning, but also the participation in these guidelines from the students and the staff the administration. Doing their job of being diligent with the mask wearing and the social distancing, um, you know, we ask you to continue to do that. We thank everybody for what they've been doing. You know, monitor the symptoms, do those things you've been doing. Don't get complacent. You know, we want, we've been successful in staying open. We want to continue on that. Hopefully we'll get back to full person and we want to continue to keep everyone safe and provide that mass instruction, which we need this person. So with that, thank you all for your time and if I look at people. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. Is there any questions or any feedback that anybody wants to give at this time? All right. Thank you. I will turn it back over to Mr. O'Brien. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to make a motion to enter public session. So moved. Second. Simmons? Yes. Attorney? Yes. Ms. Constanza? Yes. Mr. Fedorzik? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Mr. Quelch? Yes. Mr. Zawicki? Yes. Mr. Sherman? Yes. And Mr. Hick? Yes. All right. We are in public session at 7.40. Can we read this statement? I read this no, statement? no, no, Steve. Yeah. Uh, oh, shoot. Sorry. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, the Barnegat Township Board of Education appreciates and welcomes public comment, advice, and suggestions, especially when it is intended to assist the Board of Education. Please feel free to speak to the board during the public session. Comments and discussion will be limited to one five-minute period per individual unless requested by a chairperson to continue on a point of clarification. Public comment at special meetings of the board shall be related to the call of the meeting. In accordance with Board of Education policy, each participant must, recognize, must be recognized by the presiding officer and must preface their comments by an announcement of their name, address, and group affili affiliation if appropriate. Your anticipated courtesy to the members of the public and the board is appreciated. All right, now we're in public session. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, Mr. Deemer? Thank you. Thank you. If anyone in the Zoom uh, meeting would like to have any have anything to say, please uh, message a comment. We'll call on you. Chris Sir, pretty good here out there with a little uh cool girls in the district. So I was doing the same thing tonight. Just sit back and relax. I didn't realize um just how much change there was gonna be in the board. Um so I just want to say this. Up until a couple of years ago, like a lot of people in town, um I was very indifferent about what went on in the school. I voted for the school board members, it was uh a name recognition or whoever had the best signs. I guess. And then during the redistricting, a lot of us became interested in what was going on, and a lot of us were unhappy with the way things were being run at the time, um, the performance, the, 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 a lot of things. And we want to change. And we got it. This is what, what a lot of people in town obviously wanted to see. Um, and we were also very critical at that time and since then of the, not, the, not the sincerity or the hard work of anybody, but the, the performance of the board. The administration, the superintendent at times. Um, I get it. So now that we um, now that we didn't get all the change that I wanted, because I was also going to the board this year, I'm down here speaking in the microphone instead of sitting up there. Um, but now that we do have the change that a lot of people in town want, uh, when I was running, running there, there was a lot of polished politician by any means. There was nothing that was political about anything I put out or said or wanted or hoped to do or had any intent to do or any critiques of what was going on. Um, speaking now, not as a board member, just as a, a private concerned citizen of Barney Day, I do want those changes to happen. Um, I'm very, I ran with two people on the same ticket as two people on the board. I'm very friendly with a lot of other board members. Um, but my loyalty, like, like a lot of people and like everybody on the board, is more to the district the students in the town than any particular person or group of people. So I just want to say as a friend, Mr. Wyatt, um, Mr. Walsh, and everybody up there, um, and as a citizen, I hope all of these changes that we wanted and talked about and planned and wanted to make are able to come to fruition now. Um, like I said, we got what we wanted. It's always easier, probably on the other end, to talk about what you want to do. Um, I, I'm rooting for everybody. I hope that this board is able to make those changes. In, and I, I know not everything goes off the map. It's not everything. Statistics don't tell the whole story. But the improvements in test scores, the improvements in school ranking um, that a lot of us hung our hats on, that I hung my hat on, and I wanted to see improve as a private citizen, I hope those are approved. That is the positive change I hope to see from the school board. That's what I'm asking is a, is a, is a friend with some of you and the rest just is a, is a private citizen. Nothing would make me happier from this change than a year or two from now to open up Facebook and see Stephanie with an article on there that says for the first time or second time in 18 years, Barney Gate School District rises in rankings. I hope it happens. Um, congratulations to the new members, to the new board leadership, or any congratulations on your uh, reorganization. And I really honestly and sincerely hope that this is the positive change that you're able to bring to the school district. So congratulations, 
And I thank you all for the vote. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Anybody online have any comments? Motion to close public session. Second. Ms. Bivens. Yes. Ms. Cherney. Yes. Ms. Continanza. Yes. Mr. Fedorzik. Yes. Mr. O'Brien. Yes. Mr. Quelch. Yes. Mr. Zawicki. Yes. Mr. Sherman. Yes. And Mr. Hick. Yes. All right. We are out of public session at 747. I'd uh, like to have a motion for item number 15, motions one through five. So moved. Second. Okay. Here we go. Yep, yep, yep. I got Miss um, Bivens? Yes. Miss Cherney? Yes. Miss Continanza? Yes. Mr. Fedorzik? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Mr. Quelch? Yes. Mr. Zawicki? Yes. Mr. Sherman? Yes. And Mr. Hickey? Yes. All right. Motions carry. Um, for, for those of the board members, there's a code of ethics that's on your uh, seat there. If you could just sign that and give it back to me, we need that for the record in the board office. Thanks. And no, uh, no executive session during this meeting? Okay. Uh, I have a motion for adjournment. Of so moved. Second. Second. Jump right on. Miss yeah. Bivens. Yes. Miss Cherney. Yes. Miss Continanza. Yes. Miss Mr. Fedorzik. Yes. Mr. O'Brien. Yes. Mr. Quelch. Yes. Mr. Zawicki. Yes. Mr. Sherman? Yes. And Mr. Hickey? Yes. Uh, we are adjourned at 749. Thank you, everybody.